Shall we turn our Bibles to the first epistle of John to continue our meditation from where we left off? 1 John chapter 2, verses 28 to chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. 228 of 1 John to chapter 3, verse 3. Shall we look into the scriptures as I lead you in the reading of this passage? Chapter 2 of 1 John, verses 28 to verse 3 of chapter 3. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It doth not yet appear what, sh what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. The return of our Lord Jesus Christ is a sure event. John said in verse 28 of chapter 2 that he shall appear. You see, if Jesus is going to come as he has promised, it's important that we be sure about it and be confident and to be confident to face him. Not to have confidence to face him is a terrible thing. It's a terrorizing reality. Jesus has promised to return to take all his people to be with him forever. In John chapter 14 verse 3, Jesus said, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. What a wonderful promise. There is no doubt in it. That's why John said, he shall appear. Because Jesus said, I will come again. Now here are some other Bible texts that tells us without any doubt, categorically, emphatically, with such clarity that our Lord is coming soon. Listen, Colossians chapter 3 verse 4. The Bible says about Jesus, when Christ who is our life, shall appear, then shall he also appear with him in glory. What a great promise to all those who trust in Jesus. When Jesus will suddenly appear, when he manifests himself, he is going to manifest in glory, not as a baby born in a manger to be crucified by mankind again. No, he has done it. He bore our sins and he died for us. So next time when he reveals himself, it shall be in great glory. The beauty of it is, all those who trust him now as, his, as their savior will appear together with him in glory. And that's our hope, isn't it? Now listen to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. There the Bible says, Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So he came first to offer himself to bear the sins of many. Now all those who trust in him by looking at him will have this promise that he will appear the second time that we may be redeemed forever. In his presence. One more verse. Just to confirm this. From the last book of the Bible. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. Behold he cometh with clouds. 
and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him what a wonderful statement at the end of that verse we are told to pray even so amen the Lord is coming soon to all those who look for him are you eagerly living in the hope of his return or have you forgotten you know Christians we should live every day in the hope of his return are you hoping he will come or are you hoping he, he wouldn't come unfortunately this is a reality you see to all who love him this second coming of Christ is an event that they hope would happen sooner than later everyone who loves him and live for Jesus glory and believe in his promise of the coming eternal glory wait to see him coming quickly uh, John the Apostle was such a man so we are taught in Revelation 22 20 when Jesus said surely I come quickly to pray amen even so come Lord Jesus you know when I read this some time ago when I preached from the book of Revelation I said I must sing a song about this that's how I ended up writing a song come Lord Jesus are you familiar with it some of you are Come, Lord Jesus, just as promised for the bride, thy church. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, and take us to thy heavenly home. This we pray, not because we doubt thy promises. And it goes on. I can't remember all the lines now. But this is simply because... The Lord promised and I can't wait to get home. I came back from Ethiopia and told my family this morning uh, about some of my experiences. And I saw my second son jumping up and down. I want to go. I want to see this again. You see, a little bit of the things that I said about Ethiopia make him so excited. But if I tell you all things about heaven, will you feel the same? You should. I just told you he's going to come in glory and when he appears in glory we shall also appear with him in not weakness not in corruption not in sickness not in death but in glory eternal glory you know the glory of this world is nothing if you live in a palace you have all the glorious diamonds and jewelries to put on and wear the most expensive clothes and drive around in the most luxurious car and you have everything that a man would desire in this world let me tell you it's nothing it will all soon fade away and its glory shall end with your grave and nothing more nothing in this world is worth pursuing if you pursue anything at all, let it be the coming of Christ and the glory with it that will come for you and me. Christians, it's time, it's time more than ever before to think of Jesus' return and always live with the prayer, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Unfortunately, some people in the church apparently hope that Jesus Christ will not come so soon because they are unsure whether they will be found with him when he returns some people in the church are not sure whether they are saved very very unfortunate some others are sure of being with him but feel ashamed that when he will return, they will be found unfaithful and lazy. They have wasted the time loving this world and pursuing things of, of this world and not the things of God. They are afraid and they are ashamed to stand before the Lord because they will be unrewarded instead of being rewarded. 
And they therefore hope Jesus won't come because somehow, sometime later, they can catch up with the time they have wasted. Now let me tell you, you will never catch up with time that you have wasted. If you don't make up your time and take, make every minute count right now, you are not going to make it up later. Time and tide wait for no man. It just rolls away. You either repent and do the work of the Lord now. And as you go serving, you sing, Come Lord Jesus, just as you promised. Why do we serve? To prepare for the Lord's coming. Why do we pray? Why do we sing? For the glory of the Lord to soon appear. We believe that God is glorious. We believe there is no other savior. We believe Jesus is the coming judge of the world. We believe he is the king of kings. We believe he reigns forever and ever as the king of kings. He is the king of glory as we read from Psalm 24 this morning. This, uh, uh, in this worship a while ago as responsive reading is the great king of glory to be with him in his glory is the greatest hope that we have not the people of this world not the billionaires you can work for a multinational company which claims to be the best of the world and you can be on the top of its realm. And yet you can never have the glory that Jesus' kingdom offers in all eternity. You know, my dear friends, I'm glad to be hated by this world. But to be loved by my king and prepare me for his kingdom. And that must be our desire. So let me ask this question together with you. To study this passage. What it, what it means to have confidence in his coming. What, what is it to have confidence at his coming? In today's text, the Apostle John teaches us how we can have confidence. He also explains us what it is to be confident at his coming. Let's look into our text again. Verse 28 of chapter 2. And now, little children, abide in him. Now watch this. That when he shall appear, we may have confidence. Firstly, he said, little children. He calls us all little children. Of course, the ancient of days, the one who is without beginning and end, the one who is through all eternity, the great God, the Father. He lovingly calls us mortal beings who are today and no more children. Children. Our confidence is in his love for us. If you have not appreciated his love, you don't know what it is to live in confidence. You know, people say, hey, got to have some self-confidence how to have self-confidence throw your hair back put your nose up and talk in discourteous manner talk as though you are everything and nobody else and you can do everything even though it means others doom is that self-confidence <laughs> how long can you do that I've been telling a story of Ethiopia Jeremiah and I tried to climb a mountain and I told Jeremiah don't underestimate me before you reach the top I may reach there so he started walking faster than me and I saw him halfway up the mountain I'm still at the bottom I said boy this guy is strong I can't and I tried to walk a little bit up I sat on the stone desk please bring a horse I cannot go anymore and then I sat on the horse. Thank God there was a horse. That's the first time I ever said to the Lord, thank you for creating horses. <laughs> I, my favorite animal is a horse. I love horses. The elegance, the strength, the, the beauty of horses always attract me. There's no other animal I like as much as a horse. But I never thanked God until I sat there. I sat on horses before, but I never felt... This is something that God has created just to bring me from the valley up to the mountain. Otherwise, I won't be here today. I'll be stuck there. Can't walk up. 
But I saw Jeremiah swim halfway through. Oh, I said, well, this guy is really good. When I sat on the horse, I look up again to see him. Oh, he's no more standing. He's crawling. <laughs> he's crawling his way up. But anyway, he made it. Praise God. But you see, God sent an old lady about 60 years to help him up. <laughs> well, the air there is very thin. And we are not used to that kind of air. So Jeremiah was panting for breath. But this lady always go up and down. She's so strong. She said, come on, young man. Give me your hand. Let me help you. Well, this is not to embarrass him, you know. I can't even go up. Then how can I laugh at him? But the fact that sometimes we think we are very strong. And we get humiliated by our own weaknesses, isn't it? So don't believe in yourself so much, okay? Believe in God, who is your strength. Never trust in yourself. It's foolishness. Now, dear friends, we thank God. There's a God who lovingly calls us little children. You know, I'm 43 years old. That's not bad. I've lived a long life. 43 years. I lived through my youthful days. The Lord gave me a wife and three children. And I see them growing up. Well, they have not grown up, but they are growing up. I feel almost toward the end of my, age, my life. Not yet, probably. But I'm ready if the Lord calls me. So as a mature man, let me tell you, I'm still very happy when God calls me my child. Are you? That's my confidence because this this wonderful word, little children, I know he loves me. And I know he's not going to let me go. He's going to keep me for himself. He's my father. I'm his child. I'm his forever. The more I hear him saying, little children, the more I think we all should rejoice and say, Abba, Father, we praise your name. Have your confidence in God who loves you and adopts you as his own children. And then he said very clearly in verse 28, When he shall appear that we may have confidence. Now the word confidence uh, can mean boldness and courage. The Greek word there, there's another, there is another implication which I mentioned very soon. But it means boldness and courage. In other words, children of God have no reason to fear when, he think, when they think of his sudden appearance. There must be a joyful confidence that the Lord is coming. Yes, he is coming. There is no reason for us to be ambiguous or even fearful. There's no reason for us to be anxious. We must have this freedom of loving is coming. Unfortunately, a lot of people in the church are tormented by the thought that the Lord is coming. How what a shame. Are you tormented by the thought that the Lord would come? If I tell you, hey, I can hear the trumpet of the angels. If the Lord is coming with a shout, would you crawl under the chair? Or you flip your hands like wings ready to fly? The coming of the Lord is a wonderful doctrine. It, it must cause us to have this joyful freedom to fly away from this world. Not to squeeze and press us down with fear. Confident that we may have confidence at his coming. You know that particular word also has the emphasis of freedom of speech. Now I you know I have the confidence to answer someone. But before I emphasize that, I want to bring to your attention two verses from the book of Hebrews which I think is very important when we talk about confidence in spiritual things. The first verse is Hebrews 3, 6. If you have Bible, you turn to that. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6. There the Bible teaches us a wonderful reality about the confidence that Christians must have. Hebrews 3, 6. 
But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Now Christ, as a son over his own house. Now, you see, my children do not come to my house fearing. When my son comes into my house, he acts as though he is in charge of the house. He will not let, let's say if I have a maid, to rule over him. He will not let the neighbor, no matter how old he is, come into my house and uh, exercise authority. My son is not going to obey that. Because my son has every right in my house than anybody else outside my house. Even though the servant or the maid or manservant or whoever in my house is older than him, still they have to listen to him, he is my son. Every son is right in his own house. Jesus Christ is the son of God. He reigns supreme over God's house. He is the head of the church. Now look, if Jesus Christ is the head of the church, if he is the supreme one in our house of faith, and if he has overall charge of us, if we belong to him and he exercises authority on us, it simply means we can have absolute confidence in him and in all that he has said he is going to do concerning us. So in Hebrews 3, 6 we are told, Christ is the son over his own house, whose house are we. So he has all authority and care over us. If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. If we believe that, there is no reason for us to doubt we can have that confidence. And that confidence brings about joy of hope. Firm to the end. And nothing to doubt. One sure thing about every Christian is the fact, the fact that the Lord is coming soon. We do not know what this world is going to present to us. If you were to take the events of the world seriously, you can expect anything in this world. You can expect a cyclone tomorrow. You can expect a tsunami anytime. If there is a huge earthquake in somewhere near Sumatra or Java, in the sea, there will be huge mountain-like waves going all over the ways. It can hit Singapore too. Do not say we are protected by all the islands. The waves can come riding over all the islands to swallow us too. If we have not learned that lesson, then it's terrible. Earthquakes, not that we have no no, no signs of earthquake. Many times Singapore was shaken. You call it tremor. But the tremor can be serious. Now if you have to take all the things that are happening. Remember this. We are not preserved from natural calamities. Because we are better people than those who are suffering around the world. Don't ever say that. The people in Burma, the people in China, or people in other parts of the world who are desperately suffering through all these natural calamities are not worse than us. We are worse than them. It is God's mercy. But one thing is sure about this world, according to the predictions of the Bible, all these things will increasingly happen. Even islands will disappear from the face of the earth. And that includes us. We all live in a small island. Look, there's nothing to be so sure about this world. Please have confidence that my Lord is coming. So when the mountains shake, when the foundations of the earth trembles, your eyes will look to the Lord who is coming. When piles of concrete and gravel fall upon you, when you will take your last breath, look toward the coming king who will bring you 
from the depth of the grave. The big machineries of the world may not dig your dead bodies out of the broken pieces of concrete. They may give up. They may leave you to be rotten under those huge concrete piles. But my Lord, in his glory, when he comes, he will call you to himself. We shall rise up first, and we shall be with him in the clouds forever. What a glory. Your money, your bank savings, your concrete houses, your rich cars, they all will perish. But only that, only those who have confidence in Christ can rejoice even, the sm even when the smell of death, even when the wind of destruction go across the face of the earth. When it comes the way of Singapore or wherever you may be living, you can still look to an eternal glorious land where the king of kings will reign with us. We thank God for that glory. My dear friends, this world and the glory of this world must grow dim in our minds so that the glory of heaven may grow greater. Those who love this world more and more, they cannot think about heaven. They get stuck in this world and the more they love this world, the more misery they drink in. More uncertainty comes the way. More sorrow plague their hearts. There is nothing so glorious about this world but death and destruction. It is true. If not natural calamities, it can be sickness in our own lives. It can be cancer. It can be blood pressure. It can be a stroke. One of my students in FEBZ, he just graduated and went back to Malaysia to serve the Lord. When I came back from Ethiopia, got an SMS saying he had a terrible stroke. I couldn't believe my ears. He went back to serve God, but all of a sudden he was struck with a stroke. What is this life? It's nothing. So the Bible tells us something in Hebrews 10.35. Would you please turn your Bibles to that? Hebrews 10.35. Confidence in the things that God has promised is so important. The Bible tells us, Cast not away, therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Do not cast away your confidence. Confidence in the things that God has promised because it will bring great reward. Great recompense of reward. Oh, I thank God for this hope I have in Jesus Christ. I have no hope in the things of this world. I don't wake up every morning and check through my bank account and say, Boo, I got so much money. No problem. I don't look at my children and say, Whoa, look at them. They're growing very strong. Of course they are growing strong, but I know they can become sick next moment. Oh, i rather look to the eternal promises of my Lord and say, praise the Lord. I live because I have a tomorrow. Even though it is not on this earth, it's in eternity. And that's a bright tomorrow. I love that. And that's my confidence. And I great reward for that. You know, as a pastor... I love to preach the gospel everywhere in the world and I'm not ashamed to preach and I'm not ashamed to tell anybody that I'm a preacher of the gospel because it has an eternal reward. If I say I'm a teacher of physics, what reward does it have? Maybe they will say, oh, professori, that's all. Let's finish. When I die, what can physics do? You know, the... There's a story in India, I don't know whether you have heard this story, where I grew up, my grandfather told me this story. Three professors from a university came to the village and they had to go across the river and it's a river with fast flowing water and current. They took a boat, small canoe, 
three of them got in and the boatman moved the boat into the water and one of the professor asked him uh, do you know psychology and uh, the poor boatman said what is that uh, wh where do you find that so he said oh you wasted a quarter of your life so the other man asked do you know biology and he said what is that how expensive is it can I get it he said oh you wasted another quarter of your life then somebody asked him some other ology but uh, he doesn't know that too then suddenly the boat got into a current he started to go round and round so he asked the boatman asked him do you know how to swim he said sorry we don't know so you lost all your life now <clears throat> you're going to sink here you're going to finish here you know some of us are like this we go after the things of the world that as though it is everything you know oh if you don't ha ah, ooh ah. Everything in this world, you love it, you go after it, you don't care whether there is a God, you don't care what the Bible says, this is it. Then suddenly you come to the end, you face God, doomed. We must have confidence. Otherwise, we have no reward. And our confidence must last. It must test. It must stand the test of eternity. Not for one year. Not for ten years. It must last the test of the eternal God. Do you have it? You see, a while ago I said, the other meaning of the word confidence is this freedom of speech. That you can answer the questions confidently. You are not dumbfounded when somebody asks you a question. Now the greatest question you're going to face. Where are you going? What's your confidence? You know one day I asked a man who was waiting somewhere at Topayo Gardens. I was there to evangelize. I said to him, you know what will happen to you if you die? He said, well I've got time to think about life after death. I got no time to think about this life. And we've got time for next world. Then I asked another man during one of my evangelism, where will you go if you die? Who bothers? I have no time about all this. Who bothers about the life? It's not my problem. I just worry about now. He's quite right in saying that. But he's also a foolish man. Even for this life, whatever you do, you do it in such a way that it will help you tomorrow. Correct? If it only helps you one minute, you know, you do many foolish things. You can do very stupid thing if you only do it for this moment. A lot of times we don't do that which is only helpful for this time. We only prefer that which will last for long. You know, the reason why you ask your children to study is because it may help them long term. If, if you allow them to choose momentary things, they will play. They won't study. Because what gives them excitement is not study, but playing. Correct? We don't teach our children to choose things for momentary experiences. But for lasting experience. The wisest man is one who will live in eternity in view. If you have no such scope, it's terrible. That's why Apostle Paul told us in Colossians, Set your affections, set your eyes upon things above. Love the things of eternity. So you can have a right answer. You see the next phrase in verse 28. And not be ashamed before him at his coming. Christians, though we will get to heaven, though we will stand at his presence, we are going to answer many questions that the Lord is going to put before us. We don't want to be ashamed. Listen to what Jesus said in Mark 8.38. Mark 8.38. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with holy angels. Now this is a warning to all of us. All of you who are so proud of your secular glory, 
and keep quiet about Jesus when you have an opportunity to bear witness for him the Lord says wait on the day when I return I will be ashamed of you too before my angels if Jesus is ashamed of us it's going to be a shameful experience for us all right sometimes my children ask daddy why do you tell about me like that to them so embarrassing See, it's the truth but no I don't want anyone to know hmm that's nice look Jesus says if you are embarrassed about me I will be ashamed of you before the angels do you want confidence then live a life where the Lord would praise you this is my faithful servant when the Lord will commend you for loving him listen to another important warning in the scriptures first Corinthians chapter 12 or chapter 3 first Corinthians chapter 3 please turn your Bibles verse 12 to 15 first Corinthians chapter 3 verses 12 to 15 now if any man build upon this foundation gold silver precious stones wood hay stubble every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is if any man's work abide which he had built thereupon he shall receive a reward if any man's work shall be burned he shall suffer loss but he himself shall be saved at so as by fire this is not about the great white throne judgment where God will judge the world the believers and the unbelievers separately this is about what we believe to be the Bema judgment seat of Christ or the judgment seat of Christ where believers are rewarded for the service for God it's not about salvation but this is about the judgment of the saved the every man here is a reference to Christians those who are believers it says if any man build upon this foundation that is the foundation of the Bible which is given to us by apostles and prophets and if anybody tried to live anybody tried to build the work of God as though it's biblical well he says it can be categorized either as a building made of gold or precious stones or silver or wood hay stubble what are these these are elements which can be put to test by fire some will be burned and some will not be burned those which are made up of precious metals good stuff will test will last the test of fire wood hay stubble they will be burned up and so here Paul uses an imagery imagery and then he says look every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall come and it declares because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is so this fire hmm, in heaven eh? I thought there is fire only in hell what is this fire I don't think it's literal fire in heaven uh, like the fire of hell but this is his own scrutinizing eye the Lord Jesus is described in Revelation chapter 1 as one with eyes of flame fiery eyes he will test your work even that which you have secretly done to see whether it is really built according to his will whether it is like that of gold silver and precious stone 
So when the Lord analyzes, examines our work, if it stands his test, it will be rewarded. If not, all the so-called things that we did as Christians will burn. That's why in verse 15 you read, Second, sorry, 1 Corinthians 3, 15. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Look at that. He shall suffer loss. Not loss of salvation, but loss of reward. Because next phrase says, but he himself shall be saved at so as by fire. That's why John also says, is in 1 John verse 28 of chapter 2. Not be ashamed before him at his coming. My greatest concern is not so much about I do what you want me to do. But I do what the Lord wants me to do. My greatest concern is not what I want to do but what the Lord wants me to do. Because if I'm bothered about what you want me to do and what I want me to do, and don't do what the Lord wants me to do, at the end, I get no reward. Dear friend, dear brother, dear sister, ask, what are you pursuing in your lifetime? Are you pursuing the will of God? Of your own ideas are you coming to church and serving the Lord as the Lord wants you to do or are you, as you feel like doing it if I feel like coming for worship I will come if I feel like going for prayer meeting then I will go if I feel like serving then I serve or do you make it a point that I must serve in a way I will never be ashamed when the Lord comes that is the question. Nothing else matters. I repeat, what matters is this, to have confidence at his coming and that we will not be ashamed. So that's what it means when John says, have confidence at his coming. That means we will not be ashamed when he will scrutinize it at the end. Let's ask this question now. Lord, how can I then prepare to have confidence at your coming? We are given three definite counsels concerning our preparation for his coming. Firstly, abide in him. Verse 28. Again, I'm going to read it. Now, little children, abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Abide in him. Abide in him in the sense of being at home with our Lord. You know, do not go to Jesus one day and then on the other day you go to the world. Do not be a lodger with Christ. But abide in him. Some of us have this attitude of checking in and checking out with Christ. When I feel like very, being very spiritual, then I go for a prayer meeting. When I don't feel, when I feel like worldly, I check out. When I feel like, you know, being quite mission-minded, I check in. Pastor, when are you going for missions? Other times, couldn't be bothered. When I feel like doing something, then I do it. Stop it. You're not going to be prepared for the Lord's coming. When you check out, the Lord may come. <laughs> then you know how embarrassing it is going to be. Abide in Him. Dwell in the Lord. What great comfort will we have when the Lord is our chosen dwelling place in time and all eternity? We are all going to dwell with him forever. Let's 
remember it's not just a reality that God wants us to have after our death or after his coming it is supposed to begin as soon as you believe on him the moment we believe on him we start abiding in him and let me tell you to all those who have this habit of checking in and checking out it's very hard to say that you will be found at the Lord's coming if you know the Lord Jesus is a loving Savior if you know that all his words whether they are promises or commandments or doctrines they are all good and good indeed then you should not pick and choose when to stay with him and when to obey his words you must love him you must embrace your Lord Jesus you must live with him and you must say to him Lord I desire nothing without thee Jesus said you can do nothing without me so I want to do everything that God wants me to do and I want to dwell in him and the more you abide the stronger you grow spiritually the happier you will be when you think of Christ the less you stay with him, the more you check out of Christ, the harder it will be for you to be confident about his coming and your part at his coming. Abide in him. Let ask yourself, why does the apostle urge us to abide in Christ? Is there any likelihood of some of us going away? Oh yes, this very chapter, chapter 2, has already taught us there were such people in the church. They were called apostates. You can read verse 19 of chapter 2, which we studied before. This is what John said about such people. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. So you see, now everybody who comes to church abide in Christ. Sometimes they just go out of the church. They hate the pastor who preached the word. Not because pastor did something wrong or pastor said something wrong, but he rebukes sin and they don't like it. They hate the pastor, they walk out. They want to live like the world. They want to be part of the world. So they hate God's people. Look. It's dangerous. It's already warned. We cannot have a Christian life if we do not abide in Him, in Christ, and in His will. By the way, I'm not asking you to abide in pastor, okay? Not in any human institution. But if the pastor is abiding in Christ, you better find it a joy to abide with Him. You understand what I mean? If I don't follow the Lord, don't follow me, please. That's wrong. My insistence is this. Make sure you follow Christ. If you ever disagree with your pastor or the church, let it be because you are following Christ. Not because you follow the world and you disagree with your pastor. That would be disastrous for you. It brings no good to you. Abide in him. You know, if you abide in Christ, it's very unlikely that you will turn aside into crooked ways or unrighteous ways. Because Jesus will never lead you to unrighteous ways. Abide in Him. You'll be prepared for His coming. The second advice that John gives to us to prepare for His coming and to have confidence at His coming is to contemplate His love for us. Verses 1 and 2 of chapter 3. Chapter 3 verses 1 and 2. Behold what manner of love the Father had bestowed upon us. That we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not. Because it knew him not. John says behold. The word behold calls our attention to consider and contemplate something behold look at this it is the language of adoration and wonder 
It is also both a word of wonder and exhortation. It's not a word that you should just pass by. It's catching your attention. Say, look, look here. Think about this. Consider this. Behold with wonder. Behold what? Behold what manner of love the Father had bestowed upon us. John wants us to be a people who contemplate the manner in which the Lord has loved us. What great love God the Father has bestowed upon us. That we may be called the sons of God. Think about your estate. Who are you? Who am I? A wicked sinner. A wicked man who deserves nothing but hell. What it takes to bring me out of hell and make me an heir of heaven. Now I'm an enemy of God. What does it take to make me a friend of God? Who would do that? God himself has done it by pouring his love immeasurably toward us. You can never understand the vastness, the measure of God's love. My dad loves me very much. He was a pastor. And he still, he still preaches, though he's 70 plus. He goes all over, all over India and other parts of the world to preach. I thank God for him. But there was a time in my junior college days, I wandered away from the Lord. Almost one and a half years. But I went to church. I had bad habits. You know, I remember my father looks very helpless when he realized I wandered away. He called me to his study room and said, son, sit there. So I sat. I know something was wrong because I read my father quite well. And I look at his face, I said, problem, problem. I think he found out what I've been doing. And he said, son, it's such a disappointment. After all the years of teaching, you have wandered away like this. I'm helpless. I don't know how to help you. This way is going to be doomed. And I'm sure that was the kind of path I was in. He said, only God and he can save you. But son, look to God. I cannot do anything anymore. You will finish me anytime now. He said, repent. Look to Jesus. I stood up with tears in my eyes. I went to my room. The Spirit of God worked in my heart. I repented. I gave my life to the Lord. That's why I'm a preacher now. My father loved me very much, but he was powerless. But he pointed me to the love of God that can turn my life around. My dear friends, including my own children and all the young ones who are listening to me, sometimes when I look into your life, as a pastor, I'm miserable. I cannot do anything anymore to change you. It's not within my power. May I ask you to contemplate how much God loves you. Look at him. He gave his son for you. He condescended to suffer for you. Can you still go away from him and do that which hurt him? He looks at you with love and wonderment. He did not look at you with anger. If he had, you are doomed by now. He refrained his just wrath from coming to you. He refrained. It was his love, his patience that held back his own just wrath. If God has burned you by now, he wouldn't be wrong because you deserve it. It is his love. Behold what manner of love the Father had bestowed upon us. Look to Jesus. Look to the cross. There you have the fountain of God's love. Writing the wonderful story of your redemption. 
redemption of all those who trust in him you know that assures something that that love that paid my ransom with the life of his son will never vanish it was no cheap expression of love it was not a love expressed with some poetic words if it was with time it would all fade away it is a love that is written in the blood of his son and that has eternal power of atonement to save every sinner how wonderful it is my dear friends keep thinking about it John 3 16 for God so loved the world think about it. you know that verse isn't it God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life yes the more I think about love I know my future is not going to be in peril because he said whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life maybe you have been a person who was exposed to this gospel preaching for a long time you might have been putting it aside. My dear friend, there is no hope and confidence outside God's eternal love. But once you take that love, your life will be transformed. How beautiful is the story of God's love. What does this love do to us? It says, what manner of love the Father had bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. My name is Son of God. Your name, you who believe, you are a child of God. Rejoice! You see, a while ago we said, Jesus Christ is the ruler of the house because he's the son. If I'm the son of God, where am I going to be? With the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, I will reign with Him. Heaven is my inheritance because God loved me. The more I think of God's eternal, infinitely rich, unperishing love, the more I'm sure about my standing at His coming. How wonderful it is. That's why, you know, in this particular chapter 3, in this particular text, Three times we are told that uh, we will be God's children. Verse two, chapter 2 verse 28 very clearly says that little children abide in him. We are called children of God. Little children affectionately we are called. Then in verse 1 we are called the sons of God. Then in verse 2 we are told now are we the sons of God. Three times God's love firmly says Children, you are redeemed for heaven forever. The Lord will not come and leave us behind. All those who trust in the Lord Jesus can be sure as children of God, we will be with him. That's our confidence. Are you sure of God's love? How do you know? Because God's love tells you, don't sin, right? Come away from the way of destruction. Come to me, love me, love to declare my word. Come, you are my child. If you are responding to that love that comes to you to take you away from sin and make you a child of eternity, then be sure you will be there when the Lord Jesus returns. I'm sure I'm going to be there because the Lord tells me to repent and trust his son. And he keeps on telling me not to wander away from God. I'm a pastor not because I'm a good man. I'm a pastor because God's love changed my own nature from the wickedness that once enshrined my life into the goodness of the Lord. It does not matter anymore what the world think of us you see in if you look again into verse 1 of chapter 3 it says very clearly please look at it therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not you know when the world look at us the world say hey Christians ah, I don't like this bunch of people because they don't sing the song that we sing they don't dance like we dance they don't go to places that we go it's a strange group of people you know 
You know why? Because they are not God's children. They hated Jesus. They don't like the Bible. They love the world. We have a different destiny. So God's children who say, Oh look, if the world doesn't love me, it's fine. I have God's love. To me and to all those who are heading to heaven, it doesn't matter what the world does to us. It can scorn at us. It can laugh at us. It can torture us. It can persecute us. It can cut us asunder. It can make us poor. It can cast us into the prison. It can take all the things that we have and drive us into wilderness that we may live in dens and caves. Who bother? They can never separate us from the love of God. Nothing in this world. Nothing. Wealth or poverty. Health or sickness. Life or death. Angels or anything. Any power in this world. Can separate us from the love of God. Oh when I think of love. That God has shown me through Christ. I know. I don't need the world's love because it takes me nowhere but to destruction. I love to be with God. And the more I love Him, the more I love His Word, the more I'm sure I will stand with Him unashamedly at His coming. The third advice and the last is that we must be pure as he is. We must be pure as he is. Please look at the last verse. Verse 3. But you must also contemplate another verse along with this. That's chapter 2 verse 29. But we begin <clears throat> with verse 3. Of chapter 3. And every man that had this hope in him. Purified himself even as he is pure. And verse 2 29. Chapter 2, verse 29. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. You know, if you are going to be sure about your standing before the Lord when he comes again, you have to live a pure life. Because he's a righteous king. He's a righteous judge. He is not coming to this world to take all those who li live wickedly in the hatred of God's righteousness to go to his house. He will not allow that. Who are God's children? Who are waiting for his coming? Not anyone who lives the way the way they live. You know this world is terrible. They teach all kinds of weird stuff. Unfortunately, I'm going to make some statements which may be not so, not so wise in this world. But wise uh, in a sense... Uh, for the practical aspect of living friendly with this world. But it's okay in the sight of God. You know there is a saying always. The world said. Politics and religion never mix. Did you hear that? You're very familiar. And even politicians say. Religion, religious leaders and religious people. Got nothing to do with politics. Stay out. Don't mix it. I agree. No problem. But do you know now politicians are trying to drive religions. Tony Blair started a new faith movement just last week. He's trying to bring all the world together. He was a Protestant. Now he joined Roman Catholics. Now in, in America, he's trying to bring all the religions together. Now even in Singapore, this is going to be a religious hub. One, one faith movement is becoming common. Not only that. Everybody wants us to say homosexuality is okay. It's just another lifestyle. It's an alternate lifestyle. God loves homosexuals. God loves everybody, but God doesn't love sin. Make it very clear. Heaven is not for homosexuals unless they repent. Of course they will go to heaven. It doesn't matter whether you have been a homosexual. As long as you repent from your sin, whether you are heterosexual, if you commit adultery, it's the same. Not just homosexuality. Sin is sin. Now people say gambling is okay. Last time gambling was bad. Now gambling is okay. Why? Because they love money more than righteousness. Last two weeks I was reading in the newspaper the danger of young people becoming addicted to gambling. 
It's all over the paper. And still, we are having casinos. It's not going to go down. We're going to have great, great problems in this world. Immorality, unrighteousness are embraced. Look, Christians, don't follow the way of the world. Look to the king who is coming. If you want to be in the eternal kingdom of God, then be as pure as he is pure. If you are born of God, then you would love righteousness. As verse 29 said, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. You must do righteousness. The Lord has caused us to be born again that we may leave our sin and do the righteous things that God has shown us. God has not saved any of you from hell so you can continue to sin. You know, that's how some people think. Anyway, I'm saved. I believe in Jesus. So it doesn't matter what I do. So they go on sinning. Come on, you can't be like that. That's so foolish. God not only saved us from hell, he also saved us from the power of sin. So if we ever sin, the Spirit of God tells us to repent. And we repent, we confess our sins because he is faithful and just to forgive us. And then we pray, Lord, I am so weak. Help me. Teach me thy word. Lead me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. We read that in Psalm 23. We yield ourselves to live righteous. Stop sinning. The Lord is coming. Be pure. Lest you may be embarrassed at his coming. Check out these verses in conclusion. They are very important. Hebrews 12, 14. I will read it quickly because our time is running off. Hebrews 12, 14. Listen. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. If you are not living holy, you have no hope of seeing the Lord. Follow holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Matthew 5, 8. Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Pure in heart. Not just outward religious righteousness. That's hypocrisy. It must come from our heart. Ephesians 5.5 5 has a fantastic warning. <laughs> I call it fantastic. I like it. Because it makes things very clear. There's no need to doubt who will go to heaven. Listen. Ephesians 5.5 5, For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, no covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. If you are being covetous, loving this world, if you are living an unclean life of sexual, sensual immorality, the Bible is clear, you have no chance of getting any part in heaven when the Lord returns. One more text to end it all. Turn your Bibles, please, to Revelation 22. And we end with that. Revelation 22, verses 11 to 15. This is a warning from the Lord. Verse 11 of Revelation 22. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. You know, the Lord is not going to do very much in the last days. Those who want to argue and live in a, in a terrible, sinful way, God is going to leave you to your own sin. Now, my dear friends, those who are shamelessly walking in sin, secretly covering up all your sin, I want to warn you, if you don't take all these warnings and repent, your time may be up in no time. God will give you up. Okay, so it's very clear there. Then he goes on to say, He that is righteous... Let him be righteous still. Because those of us who are made righteous by believing in Christ cannot sit there and say, I'm holy. I know how wicked I am, isn't it? Because the Lord has opened up my heart, 
and show me his great righteousness. Every day I want to be righteous more. I hate the sin within me. And I have to struggle and pray to the Lord. Lord, I'm still not all that clean. Make me all the more righteous. So nobody in the church can sit there and say, I'm perfectly righteous. Look, I'm sure going to be in heaven. And never do anything about the sin within us. Fight the good fight of faith. Let the righteous be righteous still. We are nowhere near God's holiness. Let's be like him. As holy as he is. So it's a big strive. And so it carries on to say, He that is holy, let him be holy still. Verse 12. And behold, Jesus says, I come quickly and my reward is with me. To give every man according as he, his work shall be. I'm Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs. That's a very condemnatory word from the Lord about those who hate him. And sorcerers, those who go after witchcraft, those who chase after Harry Potter and all kinds of witch, witchcraft and sorcery in your books and games and things. Be careful. It may take your heart away from God. Without our dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers, murderers and idolaters, whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Be pure as he is pure. Our Lord is coming. So remember this, my dear friends, in conclusion. Those who abide in Christ and contemplate his love more than the transient glory of this world. And thirdly, keep themselves pure as the Lord is, will have the confidence at his coming. Let us pray.